Um, as you'll see in a moment, John has some interesting observations on how an organization can sustain excellence over many, many years. I'm pleased to introduce John Schlifsky. Thank you, Mark, for those two kind words, but I appreciate it nonetheless. It's uh, great to be here today. I was saying earlier when I was uh, walking around campus, I don't think there's anything like being on a college campus in the fall to kind of recharge the batteries and energize you, and, and I feel really uh, energized. So thank you for ho having me today. It's, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure, and I'm glad to be here. Um, the title of my talk, <clears throat> today is um, something that I use a lot around the company. I like to say that Northwestern Mutual is a company for all economic seasons. It, I, I came up with that. I was rereading the book A Man for All Seasons, and I love the title, or the play. I mean, I was rereading the play, and I love the title, and uh, I thought I'm going to sort of steal that and appropriate it for Northwestern Mutual. Um, but it, it really summarizes what our company's all about, which is to deliver consistent performance across varying degrees of economic cycles and cyclicality and things like that. And I think if you know our company at all, you know we're focused on delivering long-term value both during good times and when th times aren't so good. And uh, um, that's why we talk about thriving in all economic seasons. But uh, it has a deeper meaning for our company as well. It doesn't just mean thriving when times are good and thriving when times are bad. It really gets to the fact that um, We've been around as a company for 155 years, and we're proud to pass along these beliefs and these values that we have um, to succeeding generations of our policy owners. And so for us, in many ways, uh, being a company for all economic seasons is really about sustaining greatness. How do you sustain greatness over long periods of time? And I'm not talking about decades. I'm talking about scores of years and even centuries in our case. And um, I really think the foundation of our company flows out of that. If you wonder why we act like we do, just look at what underlies sort of our business model, the foundation of what our company is all about. Lifetime relationships between our financial reps and our clients. We're not a transaction-based company. We're about a lifetime relationship between our reps and their policy owners and clients. We have a business proposition that's really tied to being relevant to our clients, whether you're 28 years old and just starting out or 22 years old and just starting out or whatever it is, or whether you're in retirement and trying to cope with the issues of how you manage your life after uh, working for a living and everything in between. And so we're, we're not just relevant when somebody's rich and we're not just relevant when something bad happens. We're relevant across the scope of an, a person's entire life as, uh, as an adult. And then on top of that, we make, as part of our business model, guarantees or promises that usually take 50 or 60 years to fulfill. I mean, when you think about it, when you're buying an insurance policy from us, all you really get is two things, a piece of paper and a promise. And the likelihood is, is that we won't deliver on that promise for 40 or 50 or 60 years. In fact, I get to write uh, letters to our policy owners who have been around for 50 years, and there's a ton of them, believe me. They go out all the time. So. Uh, you add that all up, and what we're about is this notion of having a relationship and a commitment to generations of policy owners, not just people who are part of our company right now. And ultimately what that means is that we treat new policy owners. So if you buy a policy from us today or you become a client today, we treat you exactly the same as we do people who have bought policy owners from us in the past. And it means that we expect to keep the promises that we're making today, if you become a new client, out in 2060 or 2070. Think about that. We're making commitments today that we're going to pay out in 2070. It's hard to fathom. And we don't aim to simply keep those promises, but we aim to succeed and ex exceed what we promise in terms of long-term value to our policy owners. So that's how this notion of being around for or being successful in all economic seasons came to pass. And it's generally not a top of mind business topic. If you think about it, most business books, and, and I like to read business books, are around building good companies, right? Think about the titles. Uh, last century it was In Search of Excellence. The most recent uh, hot business book was From Good to Great. It's all about how do you take a company and make it into a great one. And I think 
that we need more business books that talk about sustaining excellence. How do you maintain a high level of excellence once you've achieved it? Uh, I don't think it's easy, but it's uh, something I want to talk about for the rest of my time up here today. So when I start talking about this, oftentimes I get questions like, John, why are you so focused on this notion of sustaining excellence? And I, and I like to sort of tell it this way, and it's, it's semi-humorous, but I've been I'm 53 years old, I've been CEO for two years, um, and we have a mandatory 65, age 65 retirement policy. So I always say, God willing, the board willing, and my wife willing, not necessarily in that order, uh, the company stuck with me for 12 more years. And uh, so I'm, I, I, you, when you're in that kind of position, you're not just thinking about, okay, what are we gonna do in 2012, or what are we gonna do in 2013? But it's really the notion of what, what are we gonna be a decade from now, or maybe a decade and a half from now, and it, it gets into this notion of stewardship. You know, there's a, a uh, we all know a, a, a parable in the Bible about burying your treasure, and our management team, and me, me in particular, I don't want to be involved in a company that simply buries this treasure that's Northwestern Mutual, and then when I'm 65, tell somebody where it's buried and let them dig it up and figure out what to do with it. We have this notion that we have to make the company better. We have to improve on it for the next generation and the generation after that. And that's what's triggered this idea of how do you sustain greatness over long periods of time. And um, I think it works for corporate America, but I also think it works for other institutions, including an institution like Marquette University. How do you maintain greatness over s scores and scores of years? So let's begin by defining what greatness is. So in corporate America, we look at numbers, right? And, and I want to clarify the kind of numbers I'm talking about by first talking about what kind of numbers I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about exponential double-digit growth year after year after year in sales or in earnings or whatever benchmark you want to do. Um, it, it's, it's really almost impossible to sustain that, and it's certainly mathematically impossible to sustain double-digit increases over long periods of time. So greatness doesn't just mean, well, we grew 20% over the last four years or something like that. that that's very important, and it, even our company would love to be part of that, but that's not the kind of greatness I'm talking about. When I'm talking about sustaining greatness or sustaining excellence, I'm talking about the kind of growth that large, mature companies can aspire to and achieve uh, well beyond what may be considered the golden age of that company. So for, you know, in our case, if you go back far enough in history, there was a period of time, uh, um, I think uh, of over several decades, where we were growing at 25% a year. Now we're a $25.6 billion revenue company. It's impossible for us to grow at double-digit increases year after year after year. If we did it, at some point, we'd be larger than the, than the entire U.S. economy. Same thing's true of IBM. They had their golden age in the 50s and 60s, and now they're still a great company. They're just not growing the way they did way back then. And you could probably guess that Apple's maybe in that case. At some point, when you look at what Apple's doing now, it's kind of hard to, sustain, to think how they're going to sustain this incredible sales momentum. Um, you know, they can't, I, I don't think the, I, the iPhone 12, or whatever that version is seven years down the road, is going to have quite the zing that the first one did. So we're talking about growth that is multi-generational, it spans scores of years, and it transcends product fads or market cycles or booms or sort of the, sort of the exogenous growth that can occur when the economy gets red hot. And for us, in many ways, it's the next act of how you sustain greatness going uh, you know, on. So what happens to many companies? Well, oftentimes, once a company has exhausted sort of how it got to a position of greatness, it doesn't really have a sense of how to keep it going. They've sort of exhausted what they know, and they don't know what, what to do going forward. And that's why when we talk about growth, we talk about it from an acceptable growth rate perspective. We know we can't grow at double-digit rates. We don't want to grow at double-digit rates. So we're talking about real organic growth that's several percentage points above whatever inflation rate's going on at the time. So mid-single digits kind of growth year after year after year. And when you look at companies that can't do that, it's pretty obvious if you look, dig, deep, dig deep enough what some of the causes are. Their products don't work anymore. They're tired or they're obsolete. 
Uh, they make acquisitions that they think is somehow going to create organic growth, and they find out that one plus one really equals something less than two. They make stock buybacks, or they get over leverage in an attempt to grow their stock price, but you only get a few bites at the apple to do that. That may work in the short run, but long term you can't keep buying your stock back. Or they have credit problems, and they get into you know, a, a situation where they owe their bank and they don't know how to pay it. And, um, or you have another company enter their industry and sort of disrupt the status quo, and they can't react to it quickly enough. So let's talk about what do I think it takes to sustain greatness over long periods of time. Well, first of all, the one major given is you have to have a successful business proposition. You need to be, I always say you need to have three things to be successful as a large company. You have to have something that makes you unique. You have to be relevant to your customer base because you can only fool people so long. So there has to be something endemic in what you do that they actually want. And then the third thing is you have to be profitable. You have to be able to produce that in a way that creates a margin for the, the capital that is needed to run that business. And you learn that in business school, and I'm not going to really talk about that today because I think that's a given in terms of sustaining greatness. I want to talk about what you have to do beyond that. And I think there's um, three or four things that I want to talk about. Now, I would argue that we have that value proposition. We're unique we're um, profitable, and we uh, are relevant to our client base. So I don't really worry about that when I sit at our, you know, with our management committee and decide what we want to do to run the company. We know what we have to do to fulfill those three things. For us, that's an execution issue. It's not as much a strategy issue. For us, the issue around sustaining greatness is really the, pro the product of two things. It's this profitable business mix that I was talking about, but it's also a mix of cultural things, or uh, excuse me, of attributes that are more cultural in nature. They aren't really tied to the bottom line, um, and, and so we put them more in sort of the cultural camp when we talk about it. And I believe that any institution, large or small, not-for-profit, for-profit, university, corporation, can have these attributes, but I will tell you and, and by the way, I don't think they're a secret. When I, you, you might be disappointed when you hear what they are. But I think they're very difficult to build upon. And I, that's why I think I want to underscore them with, with you at lunch today. They require discipline. They require patience. And most of all, they require confidence because they don't all work all the time. And you have to be confident that it, it, they're going to come back in vogue at some point in time. So let, I'm going to go through six things that I think do this that help you sustain greatness over long periods of time. The first is financial strength. All great institutions over decades and decades of time are built to last in terms of their financial strength. They have strong balance sheets. They have cash and reserves. They can withstand uh, economic shocks and keep uh, going. They can withstand unexpected economic disasters. And it gives them the ability to keep going when things are really tough. And I'll tell you, it's really important. I can't tell you how many companies that I dealt with in 2009, after the Lehman bankruptcy and the big stock market crash, and we, you know, we, I'd go to an industry thing or a business roundtable thing, and I'd ask CEOs what they were working on, and they would talk about a new strategy. And we've got a new strategy, and we're going to put it in place. And, and I thought that was sort of weird, because basically what they're saying is they had a strategy that worked when times are good, but they don't have a strategy when the times aren't good. And yet we all know that our, the economy in the U.S. has good times and bad times. So if you have a strategy that really only works when things are good, you basically aren't are functioning on all time. And it's, I don't think it's a good strategy to begin with. Financial strength also reduces the fear of making wrong decisions. And that's incredibly important. It damp down, damps down the natural fear of boy, do we really want to do this because if we're wrong, it's going to cost us money. And it gives management teams extreme amounts of latitude in sort of pushing the envelope and taking your business to the next level because you can afford to make mistakes, not huge mistakes. We would never bet the company on anything, but we can make little mistakes. We can have experiments. We can pilot things. And if they don't work out, we scratch them off the list and go on to the next thing. And that's because Northwestern Mutual is a AAA-rated company. We're as strong as we can possibly be. But I think the best thing about financial strength, is, at least as it relates to Northwestern Mutual, is it creates a culture of zero tolerance of bad actors. You will never hear us at Northwestern Mutual say, we've got to cut corners in order to make this earnings thing, or we've got to cut corners because um, 
our profits don't look good this quarter or something. Because we know we're strong. We know we're going to have a bad quarter every now and then. But because we're strong, it's not going to take our eye off the ball. And, you, and it creates this notion where people do the right thing even if it costs us money. And that's what I think makes us special as a company. It's part of our blood. Simply put, our financial strength is part of our fiber because it leads to great decision making, whether the economy's good, bad, or ugly. And we're proud to say that we've always been strong regardless of what the economy's doing. Even in the depths of the 08 and 09 uh, recession, we maintained a AAA rating with a stable outlook from all the major rating agencies. So. Every company has to know that they have something in reserve to be financially strong so they don't stop doing the things they know that work even when times are tough. Okay, second thing. You have to have a positive culture built on values that you're proud of. Okay, that's, that's pretty easy to say that, but I think it's much harder to instill that in a corporate fiber of a company. And it's much more easily said than done. But to grow over the long term, I think you have to have a company that creates a positive culture, not just for the customers, but for all your stakeholders, your employees, your board, your salespeople, not just senior management, but everybody that's involved in the economic engine that, in our case, is Northwestern Mutual. And we see this culture as sort of a variation on the golden rule of do the right thing and treat other people the way you'd want to be treated if you were in that situation. And we don't let individual goals, so by, based on someone's performance plan, or our corporate goals around profitability and growth and those things, ever get in the way of that notion of what's the right thing to do. And here, I just give you a couple examples, and it, this is sort of like bragging about your kids, so bear with me, but it, it, I think it'll show you sort of what Northwestern Mutual is. The first thing is, I mentioned earlier, we treat old customers the same way we treat new customers. In other words, when we add a new benefit, so we look at our life insurance policies and we decide that the way they're performing, we can add some value to our to that policy going forward, we don't just put it in for policies we're about to, sale, to sell as a way to drum up sales business, but we actually retroactively apply those benefits to everybody that has those policies. Why? Because we think it's the right thing to do. In fact, uh, a few years ago, Forbes magazine wrote an article about us, and they, I want to quote this because I think it's humorous. They said, Northwestern Mutual has a habit of attracting new customers by giving money to old customers. And by that, they, they meant that we know that if we do the right thing for our existing client base, even if they may never buy another product for us, that sort of brand extends. It extends to our employees, it extends to our salespeople, and ultimately it extends into the world of commerce, and it makes us a company that people want to be part of. Another bit, a part of our business that I think reflects this notion of um, doing the golden rule is the way we pay claims. I'm going to just cite a recent case. Recently, a, a young woman who was a policy, of owner, a, a policy owner of ours died in a tragic accident. And when her financial representative filed the claim with us, in the home office, as part of the claims process, our claims analyst noticed that the young woman had been eligible for an additional purchase option. Now, baked into our policy, some of our policies that we sell is the ability at various times in that policy's life to buy additional death benefit, basically to increase the size of your life insurance policy. And she could have automatically exercised that additional option, but the fact of the matter is she hadn't. She hadn't exercised the benefit, and she hadn't even spoken to her financial rep about it. But we knew that there was still time left on that period. We knew that the option hadn't expired, and we assumed, because it was the right thing to do, that she would eventually get around to exercising that. So when we paid the death claim, we didn't just pay the face amount of the insurance, but we paid the amount including the additional death benefit that she would have had had she exercised that option. Now, let's make it clear. We're in business to pay claims, but we're not in business to pay claims that aren't legitimate. But in this case, it's an example where we thought we needed to go the extra mile based on what we thought that woman would have done, and we paid that claim. And the moral is sometimes you need to trade short-term profits for you know, a positive culture that comes back to you in spades. So there's no question that people feel better about working in an environment with a positive culture. And that gets into sort of um, the third thing. Money isn't the most essential thing in many people's minds in determining employee loyalty or employee engagement. And the same thing goes true for customers. Sometimes 
there's this shadow brand that goes on around Northwestern Mutual where people know that sometimes in the short run, we may be sacrificing profits, but in the long run, they're better with us. And that gets to my third thing, which is favoring the long term over the short term. I think if you're interested in providing long-term value, there's gonna be times when you're gonna to have to sacrifice short-term gains. And it's a very difficult trade-off. We're a mutual company, we don't have any shareholders. I don't have 30-year-old Wall Street analysts calling me once a quarter to ask me what's gonna happen with our earnings per share. And that gives us incredible latitude in how we manage the business. And I know for public companies, it's a different environment. They have that quarterly sort of call that's coming, but for us, we can manage for the long term because we've earned the confidence of our policy owners. And so the way we do this is by uh, focusing on the notion of delayed gratification. Now imagine, buying a life insurance policy is probably the most extreme uh, view of delayed gratification there is. If you buy a life insurance policy on yourself and it pays off, you're not even around to enjoy it, right? So there's actually no gratification. The only real gratification is knowing that you're providing for your loved ones if something bad happens. So we're, we're very heavy into that, but we also know that we have to excel over the long run because we have to maintain the confidence of our board. If we just talk long-term, but then fail to deliver against long-term metrics, ultimately they're gonna lose confidence in what we do. So it's this combination of delayed gratification combined with metrics that need to work over long periods of time, which we measure our, ourselves against, and that's where confidence and patience come in, okay? If you're measuring your performance, and our board knows that a lot of our measurements are, are gonna pay off in 2015, 2016, so that's three, four years out, you have to have the confidence of that constituency that they know that even if 2013's not a good year, we're not gonna abandon strategy, tear up the plan, and go on to something new. So you have to have people that are have at their core, as part of their personality, a long-term view and delayed gratification. Fourth, fourth point about sustaining greatness is this notion of creating a sense of community, a real team. Even beyond a positive culture, there's companies that thrive in the short run, but they don't thrive in the long run. I think sometimes it's because they don't have that sense of community, almost like a family. For employees, the way I liken it, it's less, I wanna have a team where people are less about being the star player on the team and more about being on a winning team period. And I think that's really what Northwestern Mutual is all about. We have people who are at all levels of this organization who derive more satisfaction from our organizational success than they do necessarily from their own personal success in every given year. And they have that faith in the company to know that if the company does well and they're part of it, they'll ultimately do well. And so you have to attract and retain those kind of people that value that kind of thing, that are self-aware enough to understand that it's not necessarily about them in a given situation, it's about the organization and then they can make that sort of that trade-off. So it's around team incentives, it's around shared responsibilities. It's an understanding that the team doesn't mean my team versus your team, but instead this notion of a whole company. Let me tell you an example, I, for a brief, for a year during my career, I went out to Tacoma, Washington to run one of our subsidiaries, Russell Investment Groups, who were in the middle of a CEO search. And after a couple uh, management meetings, I noticed that you know, Joe would say, well, my team needs this, and Jane would say, my team needs this. And you'd go around the table, and they were all very fervently arguing for what their team uh, needed. And I said, okay, I have a question for you. Who's on my team at this table? And they were shocked, they didn't even raise their hand. I'm like, you guys are all on your own team, but nobody's on my team. We have to create this sense of what's good for the company. And sometimes what's good for your team, Jane, isn't what's good for the company, and, and you have to be willing to sacrifice something for the overall good. So we spend a lot of time focusing on team achievements, company achievements, and I think if you watch Northwestern Mutual, you'll see very little celebration of, of individual efforts. And it creates this notion of being transparent and vulnerable and this notion that I know that I can give something up because I have confidence that the team is gonna make something better of it and eventually I'm gonna get it rewarded. So it's learning, it's constructive criticism, it's cooperation, and it all comes back to this notion of it's not about me, it's about the organization itself. The fifth thing, I'm almost done, is around homegrown talent. It's, it's, I think, an incredibly important part of our organization 
that the vast majority of our senior jobs are occupied by people who have been with the company for 15, 20, 25, 30, 35 years. In fact, we had a retreat uh, in June, and of, of the 30 top leaders, four of us were celebrating our anniversaries. We had a 25-year anniversary, a 30-year anniversary, a 35-year anniversary, and a 40-year anniversary. And I thought that was really remarkable that at that senior level of the company, just with four people, you know, you're talking over 110 years of total tenure. And um, homegrown talent, everybody likes to talk about. I think part of the secret of having homegrown talent is this noted notion that you have to sometimes sacrifice talent for culture, okay? So sometimes there are people at Northwestern Mutual who are very good performers, but they just don't get that notion of uh, it's, it's about the company, not about them. And you'll see that most of those people self-select out and go work somewhere else. And so we, we have to weed these people out, not by threatening them or not by firing, firing them, but showing them that our culture doesn't reward individual achievement, it rewards team achievement that builds up over long periods of time. And so that creates this notion that people who self-select into that culture of staying there for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years. So this is difficult, though, because sometimes leaders aren't that secure in that. And sometimes you're looking at someone on your team and you're like, can I afford to lose that person? Uh, they don't fit culturally, but they're really carrying the ball in terms of other things. And you watch superstars leave, and you have to be willing to do that for the sake of this notion that we want homegrown talent to be able to thrive there with the culture that we want. And now for my sixth and last point, and this is maybe um, the most important, you need to evolve as a person, as a, as a team, and as a company around what you're good at. You know, a lot of people, if I ask them to say, uh, tell me what, in one sentence what you think Charles Darwin's theory of evolution is. They'd say it's the only the fittest will survive or only the strongest will survive or some variation on that. But if you actually look at it, what he really said is only the most adaptable species survive. And that's what I think evolution's all about for a company is this notion of adaptability. It's, it's finding out what isn't working anymore and gravitating to something new. And I think that's true of Northwestern Mutual. I mean, if you, when I started back in 1987, we were almost exclusively a life insurance company. We basically sold a few other products. They were de minimis in terms of the total revenue pie. And we were just in the life insurance business. Now, we haven't left life insurance. It's still our bedrock product. It's our flagship product. It's where we have the most value. But we've added things to it, and we've gravitated from being an insurance company to a financial security company. And we've watched our employees gravitate their skill sets, and we've watched our sales force gravitate from being insurance salespeople to wealth management advisors and things like that. So we've undergone this evolution all around this notion of being relevant. So as a company, I don't think revolution usually wins it. I think it's evolution. It's finding ways to adapt over time to the changing landscape and never be so caught up in what you were that you can't adopt, adapt into something that's better and going forward. And I think that's what we're in the midst of right now at Northwestern Mutual. So six points, build and keep financial strength, maintain a positive culture, lend, learn when to forego short-term gains in favor of long-term gains, create a sense of community, develop homegrown talent to fill your top spots, and evolve around what you're good at. That's what I think organizations need to do to sustain greatness. That's what we're doing at Northwestern Mutual so that hopefully a decade or two from now there'll be a new CEO up here talking to all of you about what a great run Northwestern Mutual's had because somehow we found a way to sustain that over another score of years. I'm proud to be one of those employees. I'm proud to be part of Northwestern Mutual and I'm proud to talk about it. Thank you very much for listening. So we have time for a few questions. Two or three questions. Anybody have a question? I know it's hard. There's one. Yeah, so the question was, how does this notion of sustaining greatness um, impact uh, Milwaukee Succeeds, which is what I'm a part of? And just to briefly, for those of you who don't know, Milwaukee Succeeds is a relatively new effort that's geared around trying to solve the educational crisis that's going on in the city of Milwaukee. And it's agnostic about public, private, parochial, choice, charter schools. And it's really just trying to solve it holistically. And when I became CEO, 
I decided I wanted to have one thing that was sort of what I really focused my not-for-profit energy on, and we were looking at the educational landscape, and we were trying to decide whether we should go deep and sort of sponsor one school and get behind it 100 percent, or whether we should be more broad. Milwaukee Succeeds is more of a broad approach, and it ties exactly into what I'm talking about. And the notion there is, let's find out what is going on in the various schools around Milwaukee that is at the highest level of excellence. And the one thing I'm always struck by is that this school has something that's really good, but maybe not so good in other areas. And this school has its best. And let's find those things that's, that are at a high level of excellence and then create sort of this umbrella organization to get the, the best of that into every school in the city so that we can create this greatness across the entire school spectrum, not just in one particular sleeve or age group or reading dynamic or things like that. So I think it does have a lot of relevance. It's this notion of what is the best that's going on here and how do we export it to every other school in the city? Yes? So the question is around mutuality, and for those of you who don't know, in the insurance industry, there's typically two kinds of companies, a publicly traded stock company that is owned by its shareholders, and then a mutual company like ours that's owned by its policy owners. And when you're a mutual company, you don't have any shareholders. The policy owners own the company. They you know, appoint the board. They elect the board, and that's how it works. Um, and mutuality has been a huge advantage to our company, and it allows us to have this long-term focus that I don't think the publicly traded stock companies will. Just two quick anecdotes on that. The first is that a lot of the companies that demutualized back in the uh, early part of the last decade, the 1999 to 2002 period, did it because they were having earnings problems. And I think they, or sales growth problems, or something similar to that. And I think they, to go back to my sustaining greatness, took their eye off the ball of the long term, became so concerned about short term issues that they thought simply changing their ownership structure, going from a mutual and basically what's called demutualizing and becoming a stock company would solve their problems. And what they found is it, it, it hasn't. And I have two close friends in, the, in my CEO insurance industry group who are running uh, stock companies, one of which is MetLife, where I started at, as, a, as a young analyst. And they both tell me that they would give anything to put that genie back in the bottle and go back to being a mutual company because it has changed the way they operate. And they don't think they're operating um, for their policy owners the way they used to. And I think that is a huge differentiator for us. Mutuality for us is more, though, than just the ownership structure. It's this notion that I was talking earlier about doing the right thing for our policy owners at all points because not only are there customers, but there are owners as well. One more? One in the back there? John, first, thank you for coming and sharing your insights. And as you know, we have a lot of students here. I had two uh, freshmen and one grad student at my table. So I just want to pick your brain a little bit about advice you might give to them as you think about that new talent that you hire, hoping to have them be homegrown leaders down the road. So of course, we all want them to do well in their classes. Um, but what other two or three things might you say they should be doing in their next two, three, or four years of college? Well, um, <clears throat> the, the first thing I could, I could say is whether you want to be a businessman or woman, or an actuary, or uh, an English professor. I tell everybody the same thing, and by the way, I have a son who's a senior at, in college right now, I tell him the same thing. You should be taking as a diversified course load as possible. Don't just stick to your major. Take a philosophy course, take an English course, because ultimately business, uh, there is no textbook to tell you how to run Northwestern Mutual, I'll tell you that. It's all around critical thinking, the ability to analyze things, uh, the, the ability to form a logical argument, if this, then this, what does that mean, then where do I go? And that's all about thinking. That's not about coursework or a specialty. And so the first thing I tell everybody is you've got to have a, a mind that can be critical, that can do critical thinking. And I think the best way to do that is a, a well-rounded uh, education. Second thing I tell people is um, when you start in the work world, I think the era of st starting at a company and being in a position and doing that for the rest of your life is over. And the, the thing we tell all our employees is you'll probably have to reinvent yourself if you stay at Northwestern Mutual four or five or six times because the world is changing. It's, we all know this. It sounds, sounds sort of trite. But this notion that the skill set that you need right now to succeed in your job is going to be the same skill set that you need to succeed 20 years from now is, in my mind, uh, a, a fallacy. So you've got to think about ways 
to grow as a person, to learn and to, and to adapt. And it's not just the company's responsibility. We tell our employees, you have a responsibility to do that as much as we do. So those would be the two things I'd say. Well done. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Uh, say, John, as a, a token of our appreciation, we are going to present you with a crystal golden eagle, I guess, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. thank you so much. Thank appreciate you much. it. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you for all, thank all of you for uh, coming out today, and that cur, uh, uh, that's the end of our, our program. Uh, see you next year at the 15th uh, Business Leaders Forum. Thank you again. Bye-bye.